Fukushima Prefecture in northern Japan has long been famous for the beauty of its environment. Snow-capped mountains surround bustling cities. Rushing rivers feed productive agriculture. But the earthquake and tsunami of 2011 has left Fukushima more famous for fallout. Explosions and meltdowns at the Daiichi nuclear power plant released dangerous amounts of radioactive waste. The fallout contained a cocktail of isotopes. Some, like iodine, decayed within a few days, but not cesium-137. It has a half-life of 30 years. These mountains of Fukushima Prefecture look picture perfect, but it's worth remembering that while 80% of the radioactive plume from the nuclear reactor disaster blew out to sea, 20% of it settled on the rivers and forests of inland Japan. So what's happened to that inland contamination since? Japanese people are anxious to know. I'm on a radiation road trip through the fallout zone, looking for answers in unexpected places. My journey starts in the mountains with this team of French and Canadian sediment scientists. We use cesium as a tracer, a specific tracer, to track the dispersion of material from the hill slope to the rivers and then to the ocean. A landscape dusted with cesium is an ideal place for their study of sediment transport. This is the edge of the 20 kilometer exclusion zone that surrounds the stricken Daiichi nuclear power plant. The land behind me here is so contaminated with radiation that access for everyone is prohibited. Just outside the exclusion zone, Olivier Evrard's team compared radiation dose rates from newly deposited sediment with those of the surrounding soil. Cesium-137 is a worry for human health and safety because it dissolves in water, making it hard to clean up and easy to enter the body. We sample twice a year, so after the typhoons and after the snow melts, because they are just triggering the, the main uh, erosion phenomena in the region. When the snow melts in the spring, torrents of water rush down here and deposit new layers of sediment. And that's why we're here. This team has been studying these river and creek sediments for three years, and the levels of radiation are still high. In fact, the readings they've got here are the highest for any river sediments in the area. This soil washed into the stream by the snow melt is emitting about five microsieverts an hour. That's about 50 times the maximum dose rate considered safe for the general public. And just a few metres away on the forest floor, the levels are even higher, up to seven microsieverts. Six to seven? Uh, it's much higher than in the river. So Why is that? In the forest you have a lot of vegetation, a lot of litter. It's just uh, protecting the soil against erosion. And so that means that there is still a, a huge stock of contamination in forest. It sits here for longer. Yeah, that's it. Okay. We with more radiation on the forest floor, we don't stay for long. Further downstream, this dam is now empty because the earthquake ruptured the dam wall. But with the dam bed radiating a dose of about six microsieverts an hour, the problem for future water storage is clear. There's still a lot of uh, storage of contaminated material here, and we can imagine then when the level will level of water will increase again, it could be flushed uh, much later to the, towards the ocean. That could mean a succession of radioactive pulses whenever water is released for decades after the original fallout. And that's particularly important for the more densely populated areas downstream, where the chances of exposure to radiation are higher. This is the Abakuma River. It runs right through Fukushima City it's the largest river basin in the contaminated zone. So understanding where the radiation is and how it moves through this environment 
is crucial to understanding how it gets to people through the food chain. Over the last two years, Professor Kenji Nanba and his students have been investigating the link between the organic material in this monsoonal river and the amount of cesium it carries. They collect the suspended particles with a centrifuge, pumping and spinning tons of river water for five hours. The samples are analysed in a gamma ray spectrometer to identify what's emitting the radiation. The particles of soil or plant material in the river water may be small, but their size matters. The smaller particles have more potential to attach radiocesium on the surface. So it has a greater surface area yes. in relation to its volume. Yes. So therefore more capacity for the radiocesium to, yes. to bind to onto it. it. Yes. It means that the smallest of these particles can end up being the most radioactive. But, uh, this um, organic particle, if it contains radiocesium, it can be digested and uh, transferred to the body of fish. That's a concern for human consumption, and fishing in the river has been banned as a precaution. Radiation and its perceived threat looms so large in Japan that monitoring is no longer just left to scientists. From downtown Tokyo, a unique citizen science project is going global. Basically, you can use this as an example for if you're unsure how things go together. Okay? Safecast shows volunteers who may have never held a soldering iron how to build devices that detect and record radiation. I hope we can be a model for effective citizens' action in this sort of situation. Teaching people, one, how to find out what's happening, uh, to use that information in an effective way to lobby their governments and say, we checked it and this is what we found. You said it's X, we found Y. What's the reason? Engineer and long-term resident Joe Moros has helped develop their cheap portable Geiger counter known as the B Geigy that you can clip on your belt, your bike or your car. What we have here, the main component obviously is the sensor. This is a uh, uh, Geiger molar tube. It's a two inch pancake which gives it a large sensitivity uh, which helps for the low levels that we're finding in most places in Japan. Then on the top we have a, a GPS receiver which is the location and the time of day, uh, a data logger which uh, writes the data onto an SD card, a display and of course a, a microcontroller that uh, has the firmware that controls the whole system. That's what's special about this DIY detector. It enables anyone to map radiation by automatically taking thousands of measurements a day for uploading to a website. Through crowdsourcing, Safecast is building the world's largest public database about radiation, with several hundred detectors in use. Today, uh, we measure about a million locations per month, and we have collected uh, close to 70 million locations in Japan, and now actually also outside of Japan. Safecast is also working with city governments in Fukushima Prefecture. These days, fixed radiation monitors are part of the urban landscape like bus stops or public toilets. With their quasi-official status, Safecast lets the public know how the government readings of radiation dose compare with their own. No other Safecast volunteer has collected more data than Joe. 
in fact, the road I'm aiming for today has not been covered ever. New territory for Sandcastle. This is, yeah, and it, which is surprising considering it's in Fukushima and we're at year three. We've covered almost all the roads multiple times. In the last few years, he's driven almost 80,000 kilometers as his Geiger counter takes a reading every five seconds. This town was under the radioactive plume and heavily contaminated. The contamination was, was severe here, and so it was evacuated, but obviously people are back now. One of Joe's aims is to check how well decontamination has worked. Well, if you want to have the most uh, effectiveness in cleaning up, you need to, of course, clean basically everything, but you should concentrate on the areas where the stuff is likely to accumulate. In the bottom of these gutters, there's going to be runoff and, and dust that's settled that's likely to be more contaminated than the surfaces right around it. You take a measurement like this? You can, but it's a little bit far, because this, this gutter is about a meter deep. Um, but the sediment down there is probably very highly contaminated, unless it's been uh, swept out. Well, even from here, I'm getting a higher reading than yeah. anything we've seen so far on the street. Mm -hmm. And we've found that, you know, in even just a couple of meters, the downhill side of the road is, has higher contamination than the uphill side. Maybe the contamination was uniform on the day it came down, but different environmental factors cause it to wear out and move at different rates. So the radiation hasn't disappeared in the areas where the levels have fallen. It's just moved and gotten covered or concentrated in certain areas. Like, you look at the bottom of this pipe here. Put your detector there, you'll see that it's really uh, active. Much noisier. These measurements are in CPM, or counts per minute of ionising events that indicate the intensity of radiation. At least if residents are aware of these hotspots, they can avoid them. She thinks it's okay, she's not really sure, but basically she feels it's all right. Arigato. See people come around. So in a community where you've got a mixture of houses and gardens mm -hmm. and agricultural areas, do you expect to see more variation there? We originally at one time tried to make a map of how contaminated the land was to try and get an estimate of how uh, dangerous the food might be that was grown there. And what we found is that there's almost no correlation between the contamination level or the, the dose rate reading in a field and how the food might come out. Because there are factors like the, the organic uh, content of the soil or how sandy or other inorganic material is in the soil. Apparently spinach, uh, the Japanese herb shiso, those tend to concentrate the cesium and, uh, and shouldn't be grown in areas that are contaminated at all. But the good news here is that cleaning has reduced the initially high dose rates to within safer levels. However, within areas that remain evacuated, armies of workers are still decontaminating forested land and rice paddies. In a flurry of activity, Vegetation is cleared and the topsoil removed. The contaminated material is stored in bags and carted away. The sheer scale of the work needed to clean up this country is mind-boggling. Imagine if you had to cut and scrape and wash an area the size of Sydney or Perth or Brisbane. Well, the area of Japan that's officially contaminated requiring this kind of cleanup is larger than the area of all of the Australian capital cities combined. But how to dispose of what's in the bags has yet to be resolved. And there's no guarantee that all this work to clean the land will be enough to decontaminate it to a safe level. Joe has just compared radiation readings in forest a few hundred metres up the road with this area that's just been cleaned. And he doesn't find any difference. The levels we're seeing around here are about 0.6 microsieverts an hour to 0.7 microsieverts an hour. And the goal the Japanese government has set for people to move back into evacuated areas is 0.23 microsieverts an hour, an hour. So this is about three times the level that would be required for to meet the standard that the government has tried to set. Even after it's been treated? Even after it's been cleaned up. In addition, the research by Olivier's team shows that erosion from areas where decontamination works are underway actually increases contamination downstream. It reflects their finding that rivers are continuous sources of contamination to the sea. We're very surprised to see that in the upstream part of the catchments, we have depletion of the contamination in the recent riverine sediments. So they're the white dots? Indeed, the white dots. 
Whereas in the coastal parts, you see a concentration of heavily contaminated sediment, which is pictured here by the black dots. Over several years, more than 75% of their sample sites show a rapid and massive transfer of radioactivity from the highlands to the coast with each snowmelt and rainy season, a new source of contamination that until now has not been taken into account. I find it really striking this story of uh, you try to do something, but then you think you control it, but in fact you don't. It's just nature controlling everything. How the radiation might affect human health in Japan is yet to be seen. For a problem that will last at least a generation, providing people with online maps of accurate and standardised data is an essential step. We found a way to get people involved and make them trust what we're doing because they're involved themselves. When they help gather the data, they have an inherent belief in its trustworthiness. So this has helped us get the message to people in a way that they can understand and believe. 原発事故というのは福島県民にとってあれは日本にとって大変不幸な出来事でした。でもそれをで回復するために私たちも頑張ってますし、世界中の放射線放射能の研究者あるいは環境学者いろんな方々の支援をいただいて一刻も早く復